All right. Sabrina from Oregon and Susan from Texas, Amy from Santa Fe and Joe from Toledo. Welcome, welcome. Let us know also what kind of organization you're with. Megan from the Animal Shelter in Wyoming. Excellent. Nikki from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Wonderful. Okay. Eileen, if you want other people to answer your question, uh, which I will repeat, you need to put it in the chat box, not in the Q&A box. I don't think attendees can see the Q&A box. So um, Eileen wants to know if anyone has created an appeal for furloughed employees relief, any suggestions are welcome. So go ahead and type those into the chat box for those who want to answer that. Excellent. Great, okay. And we will get started in just a couple of minutes. So welcome. All right, if you're just joining me, type in the chat box where you're calling in from, what organization you're with, and we will get started in just a few minutes. All right, so for those of you that are early, I'm gonna put a few questions in the chat box because we're doing this town, stall, town hall style. So um, I got a few questions in advance that I'm gonna send out to the group at large. All right, so um, let's see. Um, yes, Andrew Miller, I remember you, of course. Hello, welcome. All right, so Eileen's asking in the chat box, so town hall, go to work, uh, hive mind. She says, I'm wondering if anyone has created an appeal for furloughed employee relief. Any tips or suggestions? And if you have some, make sure that you're replying to her or to really all, let's do all attendees so everybody can see your answers. I'm sure everybody's curious about that. And I'm gonna type in one more. Hello, Lisa from Edmonton, Canada, welcome. All right, so I'm gonna type in, whoops, I think I'm gonna put in, oh no, I'm not, I can't copy and paste. Hold on, one more try. Uh, copy. All right, we will get started in just a couple of minutes. Ah, there it goes, let's see. Uh, Karen, sent in a question in advance, so I'm putting it in the chat box. Hopefully, Karen, you're here already, uh, who asked, is anyone promoting giving from the stimulus checks and around the 300 universal de deduction? And if so, how? That's Karen's question that I just sent out there. All right. Um, all right, if you're just joining us now, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box and also let me know where you're calling in from on the chat box, in the chat box. Yes, okay. All right. Oh, <laughs> oh Susan, no artwork on the wall. I'm assuming that you're referring to where I normally work which is in my office upstairs. And down here, I am in the basement because now I have kids who should be in school, but they are at school at home. So I have moved myself to the basement um, and I am working and I am freezing. It is so cold today in New Jersey. Um, that's where I'm calling in from. All right, next question, Julie's asking, is anyone planning campaigns around May 5th, the Global Giving Tuesday? So if you have any thoughts or advice, or if you're doing global giving on Tuesday, go ahead and put that in the chat box. Oh, Susan, you had snow in Massachusetts this morning. Yes, I'm ready for spring. I am cold, cold, cold. All right, look at that, it's three o'clock. Um, so I have invited, <clears throat> 
uh, a guest today, Stephen Shattuck, who is finishing up a webinar as we speak. I am sure he will be joining us shortly. Let me just make sure that he's not up. Oh, all right. Yes. Okay. He's on his way. Um, <laughs> so Thomas wants to know, um, it's a difficult time for startups. As for all administrations, the wheels have fallen off the wagon. Any suggestions? You know, I think we'll we'll unofficially start. Um, we'll unofficially start with Thomas's question, <clears throat> and I think it's a challenging time for all organizations. Oh, Stephen, welcome, welcome. We we're just hey. hey, how are you? Good, good to see your face. Yeah. <laughs> See you too, everybody. This is my friend, colleague, mentor, and friend, <laughs> Stephen Shattuck. Oh, oh no, other way around. <laughs> um, Stephen is. Uh, what's your formal title at Bloomerang? It changes. It's. I think it's Chief Engagement Officer right now. We'll Chief see what happens. Chief Engagement Officer. Yes. Yes. You should. Yes. Well. Uh, yes. Jack of all trades and master of all trades. So <laughs> some, like maybe yeah. one or two. All right. So being um, late to giant town halls is one of them. <laughs> no, no. Welcome, welcome. We were just getting started. I told them that you were just wrapping up a webinar. So yeah, it was a good one. Be joining us. So I am so so excited. We've already got tons of questions in this chat box. I was just saying hi to all the hundreds of people that are joining us from around the country and around the world. We've got Canadians. We've got someone from mm. Australia. Um, oh, wow. It's 5 a.m. in Australia, but she gets up oh, and wow. joins me every week. Um, Lori <laughs> said awesome. hi from Burlington, Vermont. So anyway, oh, so it's, it's, a, it's a rowdy crowd, Stephen. You're going to have to uh, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> keep that's up my favorite here. kind of crowd. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, Any that's Blossom in the background. That's my orangutan. Yeah. Yes. Anybody who doesn't know, food. she's the mascot from Bloomerang, right? <laughs> All right. So let me give you a formal yeah. introduction. We'll go ahead and get started now. It's 3.03 .03 okay. Eastern time. So we'll, we'll start officially. So hi, everybody. Uh, I'm guessing most of you know me, but I'm Amy Eisenstein, <laughs> and I'm pulling together these town hall sessions every week for as long as the crisis lasts. I feel like everybody in fundraising needs a community right now. Um, sometimes we just need to lean on each other for support and for comfort and for advice and for wisdom and to sort of take a break. Uh, I think fundraising in general is a very isolating sort of field, um, especially if you're working at a one person shop and now you're at home and even isolated from your other colleagues. And so it's super important that we do these check-ins and and as you all know, we'll be doing them every Thursday until the crisis ends. So, um, so welcome. So today, this is the first time, uh, I guess this is the fourth week we've done this. And this is the first time I've invited a guest. And I am- just, Oh, wow. Yep, yep. So- Did you get like 27 no's before you asked me? Probably? No, no. <laughs> Stephen was the first person when I thought, oh, you know what? Maybe people are sick of hearing from me. I better do something to uh, liven things up. And um, I said, okay, Stephen's going to be my first guest. guest. So uh, I'm going to let him in a minute introduce himself more thoroughly than I can. But I just want to tell you all that I am a huge fan of Stephen's. Um, he has been with Bloomerang basically from the start of their, he'll tell you what Bloomerang mm -hmm. is in just a minute, but um, he, Stephen and I have done webinars, workshops, and uh, talks together. We travel around the country. We bump into each other at all sorts of conferences and meetings, and um, I'm just a huge, <laughs> huge fan. He's one of the smartest people in fundraising I know. And so... We are going to talk about fundraising success and how to be successful at fundraising during COVID-19. And we're going to talk a little bit about data-driven tactics um, so that you can raise money through the crisis. So Stephen, let me let you introduce yourself and, and put in any plugs for Bloomerang that you'd like to. And then we'll kick it off with a few questions um, and then let attendees ask you some questions too. 
Well, that was pretty good. I don't know how much to add. I mean, I, I feel like I kind of hit the jackpot with my job. I basically get paid to 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 goof off and and do webinars. Usually, I'm I'm on the other side hosting. That's what I was doing before this. We have a Thursday uh, webinar, although we've been doing webinars almost every day for the same reason that you're doing these town halls, just to to get that good info out. But um, lately, what I've been doing since I'm not on the road, um, sharing data like I normally, and I've, I've just been sharing um, successes from, from our customers only because that's who I'm, I'm able to really see and dig into the data. Obviously, they're not the only successful organizations right now, um, but um, just sharing that knowledge that hopefully other people can draw inspiration from and, and, and you know, find something that maybe, maybe will work for them as well. Um, so all April, I've been just looking, kind of creeping a little bit on on what uh, what folks are doing and, and what's been making them successful. So I, I got a few insights, uh, at least from from our customer base of, of what they've been able to do to, to raise money over the last you know, 30, 45 days or so. Awesome. So we're going to get into that. That's going to be really valuable information for our folks. So just so everybody knows, so um, I don't know if you said this because I was busy reading the chat box. Bloomerang is donor CRM. Uh, yeah, we're a donor database. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have in the chat box, Eileen says, we're just moving to Bloomerang as we speak. Oh, nice. Um, so Good. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. So you know what? If you're already a Bloomerang customer, oh, so, and Andrew says we've been on Bloomerang for 11 months. So if you're- Oh, nice. Um, okay. Cool. So Stephen, can you see the chat box? Open up your job. I can. Yeah. I'm seeing those now. I just opened it. <laughs> All right. Great. So <laughs> that's awesome. A lot of fans on the, uh, on the line already. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. So- what do you think folks should be looking for in their database and that, that would be able to ha help them through this crisis? And by the way, Stephen's so good, um, yeah. he's gonna answer no matter what kind of database you have. So don't think, oh, we don't have Bloomerang, so this won't yeah. fly. Um, he's gonna talk to all databases, uh, all good databases anyways. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this will be agnostic. Um, the main thing is that they're, they're not talking to everyone in the same way. So uh, this, this crisis is, is affecting lots of different people um, differently. And, and this, this is good advice, no matter whether we're in a pandemic or a crisis or not. But if you are able to you know, create little segments or cohorts of different types of donors and communicate to them differently than, than others, and not wildly differently, just in sort of nuanced ways, that just kind of shows people that that you're paying attention and reaching out to them contextually. So, for example, you know your monthly donors, are, I think, are a really good cohort right now to maybe be reaching out to and saying, "Hey, we just we we so appreciate that sustained support. You know, you're a monthly donor. We're so appreciative of that. You're the lifeblood of our organization. You know, we just want to make sure you're doing okay. That's a pretty good rule of thumb right now is to reach out to all of your supporters and just kind of make sure that they're doing okay." before you thank them or ask them for money or whatever. Um, but that I think is the number one thing. And, and But those cohorts, to kind of answer your question, really makes a difference of whether you're gonna be able to move the needle. So monthly donors, I think are a great one. Um, maybe major donors, you know, people that represent that 10 to 20% of your uh, top givers that are probably giving 80 to 90% of your total giving making sure that you're reaching out to those folks and checking in with them and making sure they're doing okay. You know, same rules apply as, as perhaps the monthly donors. Um, and then, then kind of drilling down into um, other interesting groups that, that you may be able to say something to like volunteers, you know, you probably aren't having in-person volunteers with you now, but maybe reaching out to them and saying, um, you know, we appreciate that you were a volunteer. Here are some other ways that you maybe you can help us virtually, you know, sharing our so, your so, so, social media posts, um, maybe doing some in-kind donations if you're still accepting those. But I think the main thing is making sure that you utilize the database, right? That it's not just this giant bucket of, of, of names and, and email addresses, but that they are different types of people that you should be sort of contextually reaching out to. Um, in different ways that make sense for the type of supporter that they are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a few that you haven't mentioned, you started with your major donors, some of your biggest donors, of course, those are the obvious ones, and recurring donors, so loyal donors looking for who not only just gives monthly, but also loyal donors in terms of your once a year donors who have been giving for 10 or 15 or 20 years. Um, and yeah. so that's another cohort. 
We also like to talk about recent donors. So maybe your first time donors yep. gave this year. So there's lots of different ways to slice and dice the data. Um, so Ed's asking, um, Stephen, when we're reaching out, is it best by email or phone to monthly donors or some other way? What would you say to that? Yeah, I think probably email and phone is going to be your best bet. You know, sending mail right now is a little bit dicey and, and receiving mail. Some people are, are, are worried to do that as well. You know, if you've got a phone number, I would start there. Honestly, I wouldn't necessarily go hunting for a phone number or try to call someone's employer and, you know, get through the switch line or whatever. Um, but if you've got a phone number, uh, I think that would stand out. Um, I, I'm a monthly donor to about 13 organizations here in Indy, which is higher than normal. That's just because I'm a weirdo and kind of a philanthropy geek. But I, and I haven't heard from any of them, I, you know, and, and that that to me is a little weird because I have been a monthly donor for so long. Um, and, and I would love to hear how they're doing, um, maybe how their services have pivoted and just that appreciation again for the monthly uh, commitment. But if you don't have a phone number, I think email can be just as good. But again, a one-to-one -one email where you're literally opening it up Gmail or Outlook, typing in Amy's email address and saying, hey, Steven, I'm the ED or hey, Amy, I'm the ED over here. Just wanted to check in, make sure you're doing okay. Thank you for being a monthly donor um, versus kind of maybe a mass email. Even if it's a mass email to all monthly donors, I don't think that's as personal. Um, the, the phone calls are powerful. We actually did some research um, recently among the, the Boomerang customers who were making phone calls uh, versus those who weren't. And the ones that were making phone calls, and I'll share the, the link to the research later on if you want to see it, um, they had higher uh, retention rates, uh, higher gift amounts, and they also were able to get gifts faster from those donors that they called their next or, or subsequent gift. So the, the phone is really powerful, um, especially in this sort of digital age where we're getting inundated by emails and, and junk mail. Um, I think it really will stand out. Even a voicemail, you know, is just as good. If you're, if you're leaving eight out of 10 voicemails, I, I wouldn't be discouraged about that. But if they do answer the phone, you know, that's, that's a great opportunity for a conversation that, that could lead to, to bigger and better things down the road. Excellent. I think you are absolutely right. So we've got tons of uh, questions coming in. I, I do, uh, I have seen a few questions specifically about things that Bloomerang can do, and I've asked them to follow up with you afterwards so that we can oh, make yeah, sure for the sure. conversation um, is appropriate for everybody, regardless of what database they're using, if that's okay, Stephen. Okay, so, um, that makes sense. Yeah, talk about other things that you've seen successful organizations doing to raise money during this time. Well, I, I don't mean to sound snarky, but the, the number one thing is that they're asking for money. Um, and and it, it breaks my heart because my, my inbox has been full of people saying, you know, we're, we're non-essential or our, our cause doesn't matter right now. Mm -hmm. And, and I've, I've had a, more than a few visceral reactions to that in kind of a loving way because I'll, I'll look and see what their organization does. And, and I find a lot of uh, library foundations and um, animal rescues. And those, those causes in particular are really meaningful to me. And actually, I've, I've, I have donated to organizations like that in the past 30 days, because even though they may not be providing meals to people who have lost their jobs or medical services or masks or th those things that tend to be getting a lot of the attention right now, they matter to the people that um, they have always mattered to, and maybe even matter more now. I mean, I've, I've got two kids at home. They're not in school. We were going to the library a couple times a week. My son is an avid reader. He's eight. He would read for 16 hours a day uninterrupted if we let him. <laughs> and that, that has impacted our household, not being able to go to the state parks here in Indianapolis. You know, and, and no state park is providing so-and-so vital medical services, but that still matters to to our household. And, and I know I'm not the only donor that feels that way. So and I don't mean to, to be uh, emotional about this, but the, the folks, at least in, in our customer set, who I've seen be successful within those categories, what, and I asked them, I, I've been doing some video interviews, I'll share that with you all later on if you want the link, but they said, we, had, we, just, we said we weren't gonna let that fear prevent us from reaching out 
um, to the people that that care about our cause or have previously cared about it. And I think getting over that fear was maybe 75 to 80 percent of of their success now once they started asking money how they did it of course was 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 um a, a contributor to the success and we can talk about those things but all of them said one of the first things they said was we have a supportive board who said let's go you know we're not gonna we're not gonna let this it's it sounds a little tacky to maybe refer to it as an opportunity but we're not gonna let this moment perhaps pass by um, and, and not give our donors the opportunity. Cause if you decide on behalf of your donors, it's over. Right. But I, I don't think you should decide. And, and certainly there are people in your database that have been affected financially, personally, but that just goes back to reaching out to them because that will help you identify who those people are, but don't let one or two people who may react negatively out of a thousand or 500 or even a hundred, you know, stop you. Um, someone just said, don't assume. I, I think that's great advice. That was the number one thing that we heard in the webinar that we just did an hour ago um, is, is don't make assumptions, you know, ask, but be contextual, you know, your services. I think all of you have a service that is being missed right now. If it's not sort of a direct medical or maybe food related thing. You know, people can't go to the library. People's kids aren't in school, but the, the education foundation is just as important. Um, right. So that, that I know is a super long-winded answer to your simple uh -oh. question, but that's the number one thing I, I have found. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's right. Just ask. There's, there's a ridiculous number of people still. I mean, for five weeks, we've been saying, ask, ask, ask. And yet board members and executive directors think that it's not appropriate to ask now. And, right. and that, to me, I said on a webinar, I also did another webinar at one o'clock. I said, I think that's negligence, right? Yep, I agree. You're not, if you're not asking, you're damaging your clients, you're damaging your nonprofit, you're damaging your community. Um, as Stephen said, you're letting the moment go by. And, um, you know, I was listening to NPR and Stephen King was on there. Uh, and talking about how if, you know, if you think art's not important, then try spending quarantine with no books, no radio, no music, no movies, no television. Yep. I mean, that's what art is. And, yep. uh, you know, I think he's so right. People who love the arts and give to the arts are continuing to support those things right now. They don't want their favorite theater to be closed forever. They want it to yeah. continue. They want the director to stay employed. They want the musicians to stay employed. Um, so you should be out there fundraising. Your cause is no less important today than it was a month ago. And if it is, then maybe you shouldn't exist at all. And so yeah. this is a real soul searching time, I think. Um, all right, so listen, I see questions and comments um, going in the chat box. They're going by so fast that I can't quite keep up with them. If you have a specific question for Stephen, put it in the, um, the Q&A tab. The chat, I'm letting, you know, we're really focused on these, Stephen, and letting them be a town hall. So I'm so happy people are this answering cool. other people's questions. Um, yeah, I see and, that. And having conversations. So uh, Michelle is asking, is well, she asked a couple questions, I think. Is it a good time and important to be leaving a voicemail on the first try? And um, what's an example of a message that you might say? Do you want to take that one? Yeah, I think a voicemail on the first try is fine. It, it may look a little, little weird if they have multiple missed calls from the same number. Um, that's just me. That's my personal thing. That, that may, that's not data driven at all. Um, well, I think voicemail... Everybody yeah. knows you're calling. So yeah, yeah. I think we've well, messed <laughs> Voicemails are great. And, and I think it's, it depends on who you're calling, right? If you're calling a monthly donor, I think say, hey, you know, we just, we're just calling to, to thank you for being a monthly donor. Just wanted to make sure that, that your family was doing okay and, and let you know we're still here. You know, we're, this is what we have either pivoted to or this is what we're still providing. Just quick, you know, I don't think it needs to be longer than a minute. Um, but the monthly donor thing, I think, is a powerful segment because if finances get tough, you know, that may be an expense on the household, um, you know, budget that, that could get cut early, right? But if you have been proactive and gone in and maybe done that stewardship, I, I think there's, it's at least more likely that they would say, you know what, 
I got an update from them. Let's let's leave that on. Let's maybe look at canceling, you know, Disney Plus or or something else that that isn't, you know, providing really cool services. Um, but yeah, I, I I think the voicemails are are just as good for sure. Yeah. All right. Excellent. So so Natalie wants to know um, your perspective on fundraising now in a cultural context. I think we've sort of answered this question. A time when museums are closed, should it only happen once the museums resume their um, activities and officially open? No, I don't think so. I, and I like what you said, Amy, where it's you're sort of speaking to the future um, prospect of that organization you know those people we, you want them to they may want you to be around to kind of survive i got uh i got a great email from and i think this this will apply to culture organizations even if it doesn't seem like it right away but i got an email from our ymca that we're members of and and i could tell it was an email that was segmented for just members and it said you're a member this is we're closed and then obviously we knew that but we don't want you to cancel your membership is essentially what it said. And it said it much nicer and I can send it to folks if they want to see it, but we're doing virtual classes, but mostly we want to be here as an organization when it is time for the, the economy to reopen. So I think culture organizations could do the same and culture organizations have been doing really creative things, you know, live streaming, mini performances, you know, behind the scenes at, in the empty aquarium or, or, or museum or whatever it is. Um, I, I think that kind of content could help sort of bridge that gap until maybe things reopen or, or smaller crowds can be let in. Um, but don't wait. I, I don't think anyone should wait for, because for one, we don't know how long this is going to last. Um, and, and I think you can lead with the message, hey, we want to be here when things open up and, and you can be a part of, of making that happen, you know, kind of empower them um, to, to, to make that happen and kind of be the, the change agent for it. All right, great. That's great. So Stephen, people want to know how to get in touch with you. So why don't you put Ooh. that and Yeah, I will. Um, we'll put that in the chat box and we'll, um, I'll also get out Stephen's information, but <laughs> the website is bloomerang.co, B-L-O-O-M-E-R-A-N-G dot C-O. Um, and so some of your questions, Stephen's just going to forward on to people who are better equipped, not that he's not better equipped, but. Oh, there's a lot that are better equipped, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a whole team behind him that can probably <laughs> answer lots of questions and put you in touch with the best answers. Yeah. So, Let's go back to data for just another minute. Yeah. Questions are pouring in. So um, so people are going to segment their data in order yes. to reach out well, right? So for segmenting to speak to different populations like volunteers, monthly donors, members. Laps donors, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, yeah. What else should people be thinking about their data for? How can it help them with fundraising right now? So... Um, I one thing we looked at is uh, the, the frequency of messaging. Mm -hmm. And by and large, the, the more frequent there was a correlation to, um, to more revenue. So, at, you know, you may reach out to all these segments, but you don't just have to do it once, I guess, is what we have seen. Um, especially folks that were sort of early to do this. I know it's sort of too late, but um, the people that got started sort of early to mid-March, right when this started to unfold, um, that sort of paid dividends for them being an early adopter. But, but frequency, um, especially if your services are changing or there are significant updates that you want to let people know of, it's okay to be you know, continually reaching out. And again, don't worry too much if you get a couple of replies or unsubscribes. That's okay. That just means that your list is getting a little bit more cleaner and more honed. You know, don't let that stop you. Um, right. Those people don't yeah. want to hear from you anyway. So it's exactly it's fine if they're gone. They had already made that decision before right. you sent the emails to them. Right. So that, that that's okay. Don't worry. Um, but again, and, and also weaving in kind of soft asks in all of those messages that, that were contextual. But to go back to your question, Amy, the, the asks is, is sort of driven by the data, what you are asking for. What we, the other kind of success factor we saw is that they weren't all asking for the same things within, even though the messaging may have seg been segmented before the ask. So an example of this would have been if there was a monthly donation um, 
or a message to monthly donors, the ask was, would you consider upgrading your gift? And then there was a link to do that. Um, other interesting campaigns were they reached out to people that they knew made consistent and end of year annual gifts, you know, consistently for the last five to 10 years. The ask to those people was, would you consider making your annual gift now early? Um, and they got a, a, overwhelmingly, they got a lot of people to say yes. And, and I'm kind of thinking that those people will still make an end of year gift in eight months, probably. So it's okay. Exactly. So anybody yeah. who's worried thinking, oh, well, you know, I actually did see an executive director say, well, if we ask now, they won't give later. No. Well, I'd rather have the money now. Right. Um, so, and yeah. chances are very high that they will give later too. Um, so Dana's asking Stephen, um, you said frequently connect with people, um, but how often is frequently? Weekly or twice weekly? Weekly. Yeah. Weekly, uh, weekly was kind of the, the baseline. Now, there were some people who did more, slightly more, slightly less. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think you'll find your sweet spot once you start going. Um, uh, you know, and, and I think if you've got something to say that is urgent, I, I wouldn't wait for that next scheduled um, cause you know, don't be too legalistic that we're going to do every Thursday, but mm -hmm. if it's Tuesday and you've got something pressing, you know, I, I, I would get it out there and you could decide, you know, do we still want to do the Thursday email or not? Um, yeah. but yeah, weekly, I think is, is a pretty good rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but you know, your, your mileage will vary for sure. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Erica wants to know if you have any thoughts or strategies for Giving Tuesday now. So there's a mm. new Giving Day, I guess, coming yep. up on May 5th, I think it is. So yeah. So are you encouraging clients to do it? What are your thoughts on Giving Days? We we are. I, I, I you know, I haven't, um, if, if you follow my Twitter or my blogs, you, you probably think I'm not the biggest fan of Giving Tuesday. Um, not a, not a negative feeling about it necessarily. I, I tend to shy away from kind of those mass, mass, um, uh, fundraising days, but I, I don't mind this one perhaps as much as I have minded others, because I, I think it could be good to show people that there is a lot of generosity out there if they just would be willing to ask for it. So if it can maybe shake some people out of that fear, I I'm all for it. Um, now, but to answer your question, I, I wouldn't wait because it's still three, three and a half weeks away. That's an eternity these days. I mean, I don't even remember February necessarily. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't wait, but I would do something on Giving Tuesday. We've had a lot of customers have success with using it as a day of stewardship and thanking um, and actually get some gifts because of that, even though they weren't explicitly asking. Um, but for the tips and tricks, I, I actually uh, convinced a Giving Tuesday employee to come onto my webinar series, and she's going to be there next week. So uh, it's a free webinar. Um, it's on, I think it's on next Tuesday. I'll send you all the link to it in the chat um, when I get the, my next break here. But um, <laughs> you'll hear it straight from her because she's got six or seven years of Giving Tuesdays, and she knows what works and what doesn't. I think this one is unprecedented, so there may be some things that uh, that may be new about it that may not work or, or work better. Um, but you can hear straight from her, but I would encourage you to participate because th there's so much generosity out there. I mean, my Facebook feed is, is full of people um, raising money for um, people who were laid off for teachers and, 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 you know, nonprofits should be getting in on that generosity. There, there are people that, weren't hit as hard and maybe not even hit at all. People are going to get stimulus checks soon if they haven't already who may not need them, especially people who are already perhaps retired and, and, and sort of living on a set budget and living comfortably. So not only is there generosity, but there's sort of weirdly, there may be some extra um, liquidity that, that could come our way here in the next few weeks. So, um, but, but check out the webinar for sure. All right, I'll, I'll chat for a minute while you put your contact information in the okay. chat box because so many people are asking for it, Stephen. Um, and you can tell them where to go to sign up to have a conversation yeah. with a Bloomerang techie or something. <laughs> I don't know what you call. call your <laughs> Techie's good. Yeah, techie. Um, so I will tell you that um, I think what Stephen's saying is so true. I want you all to remember, and I may have said this last week, but 
people making annual fund gifts and emergency gifts are not doing so out of stocks from the stock market for the most part. They're yeah. making fun uh, gifts from their cash flow. And if they have transitioned to work from home, if they're working, their cash flow has not gone down. It has actually increased because yep. they're not eating out as often. They're not going to the bars. They're not going to theaters. They're yeah. not going shopping. Um, you know, a few people may be shopping online compulsively, but most people are not. I haven't been doing that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I feel I've heard from so many people um, that their bank account, their cash flow, if they have stable jobs, is actually up. Right. And so um, I think it's really important not to make assumptions about what other people have. I know, um, yes, and Rick's reminding us that donors want to be thought of as people, not as ATMs. That is yeah. so true. Good point. So people really want, if you're stuck at home, which almost all of us are, um, we're desperate to help. I, I want to yeah. know how I can help. I want to know what I can do. And I think um, your donors are feeling that way. You can make them feel good by letting them help, by asking them help for help, by giving them opportunities to help. It's not, it's not a bad thing. All right, so let's take a look at some of these questions that are flowing in here. Um, did you see any that you particularly wanted to answer, Stephen, or should I just read you another one? I, I didn't see, they're summoning in so fast, it's hard. There's a, I know, um, okay. Um, all right, so uh, um, let's see. I would love to get ideas of what others are doing around online fundraising as an alternative to the more traditional event fundraising that's not happening right now. Good question. That's from Roxanne. So if you've seen any online fundraisers, how are people transitioning to online galas, golf? Yeah. Know, or any, any way you want to interpret that question. On the on the success page, uh, the case studies I've been recording, one of our one of the folks I talked to is like a twenty minute long video. It's worth watching it. But they had a gala in mid March, like so many people uh, canceled it. Didn't didn't say let's postpone. They they changed it to virtual, but the format uh, was was really smart, and they raised a lot of money. What they did is that between the date that they canceled the event and announced the cancellation. And the date the event was going to happen, which was maybe like a 10 or 14 day period, they in kind of drips and drabs uh, sent emails that each uh, had a, kind of a, a bit of a piece of content that they would have gotten at the event. So one email may have been a video with one of the speakers and they were able to do a, a webcam recording or a cell phone recording of what that speaker was going to say at the event. Mm -hmm. And so they sort of doled out the content of the event. It was maybe four or five speakers and a couple of maybe other things, but you, I'll, I'll send everyone the link so they can see it. But it was brilliant. And every email generated revenue because they were showing off former service recipients. They were showing off other thought leaders who spoke to the value of the organization. So rather than saying, let's put 300 people on Zoom and try to and have all the speakers come in and talk to them in that one or two hour period, they just changed the event into email content and kind of sent it out in, in drips and drabs, which I thought was really brilliant because it was it gave them multiple touch points. They were very natural, um, and they they and people didn't cancel their um, their tickets. They when they canceled the event and when they announced it, they said, "Hey, we're still going to do the event. We're still going to provide you all those stories and, and the entertainment." They didn't say entertainment, but that's just kind of my word for it. Um, and then they got the additional donation. So I thought it was a rather brilliant. And I, I think it's kind of hard to convert a gala to a Zoom meeting or a hangout or something like this. But if you can be creative in maybe um, communicating or distributing what would have been communicated in that event in another way, um, that worked out for them pretty well. I, th I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, excellent. All right, so a lot, we'll do one more event question and then we'll move on to other stuff. But Larry's asking, he's the executive director for a regional symphony, trying to mm. figure out how to advertise subscriptions for next season when next season is up in the air. Um, yeah, you, my yeah. sense is be transparent. You know, we, we aren't sure when next season is gonna happen but we want to be here for, for when it, it can be possible. And, and we want to give you the opportunity, the donor to, to make that happen. You know, would you contribute? I, I think, again, it goes back to what Amy was saying about the future. Let them be 
um, you know, the change agent to let that happen in the future when it does come time. Yeah, I think the other alternative, I mean, not to being transparent, always be transparent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, yes. <laughs> but to me, I mean, you know, plan plan your next season as if it's going to happen and yeah. have a plan B. You know, you need a plan B. So what can Absolutely. you do to, you know, get those subscriptions for your your service or your membership and um you know then you're going to have to have online concerts maybe it's a recording of that that particular artist doing something and the question is you know you can say if you are willing to let us keep the tickets or the sponsorship we're going to do the best we can online um and a few people will ask for refunds and you'll yeah. issue them but for the most part i think you should be planning for the fall, planning for the future, assume you're going to get up and running and have a plan B in your back pocket if you can. I'm glad you said that about the refunds because the, the folks, the, the Bloomerang users who canceled events who, who said, hey, we can convert, we're going to, we are going to convert your ticket to a donation unless you tell us not to. Right. And every time it was like five to 10% of people asked for a refund. Great. Right. So yeah, it's, you know, people want to help going back to what Amy said, like they want to help. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. So um, Michelle was talking about how to get in touch with snowbirds who are not in your town anymore. To me, now mm. virtual, all of this virtual stuff makes that irrelevant. You're going to reach out the same way to your next door neighbor as you are to someone who's in Florida or California. You're going to do email, you're going to do phone calls, you're going to do video chats. So honestly, this, this time um, makes that completely irrelevant. They, they, you could see your neighbor next door just as much as you see someone who's 10 states away, I guess. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, all right. So I don't know. I don't know if you want to cover this one, Stephen, and you can I'll try. pass if you want. But uh, Jill's saying so much discuss discussion in the chat box about planned giving appeals. Do it or not do it? <laughs> yeah. So there um, there was a great white paper that just came out from um, Michael Rosen and um, um, oh, his name is escaping me right now. Uh, Russell James. Yeah. Uh, they they put out a white paper that offers really good guidance on this. I'll I'll, I'll go dig it up here in the chat. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm I'm not a plan giving person at all. Um, but but what I have heard, I'm just relaying information. Is you know you you can still certainly do it, but you, you know kind of tread lightly is is kind of what I what I have heard. But I'll dig up that that white paper because it's it's really comprehensive. And it's, yeah. it's absolutely contextualized for, for what's going on right now. Good. Yeah. It was on Michael Rosen's blog yesterday, yep. maybe. Yeah. And it was very recent. It was this week right. or late last week. Mm -hmm. And I think the agitator featured it today yes. or yesterday. So you could get it uh, for the folks um, who are sitting with their computers open. You can Google it as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Good. Let's see. So I want to bring the topic back to data. And okay. maybe now that we've had so much conversation on other things, I will sort of release the restrictions. If you want to ask something about what Bloomerang does, um, go, <laughs> go ahead. But what, what other, uh, maybe before I get to another question, Stephen, what other thoughts do you want to share with folks about, you know, they're nervous about fundraising, they're nervous about asking, what's, what's the next big piece of advice that maybe you've heard in a webinar or that your clients are doing that have been successful? One more thing. Um, we talked a lot about communications from the nonprofit itself, but that doesn't have to be the only uh, uh, person. Uh, a lot of folks have been putting their donors on display. We had one organization that uh, had a donor send in uh, a check for $3,400, the exact amount of the, the household stimulus, and said, we don't need the stimulus, we're giving it to you. Now, the organization didn't ask for that. There was absolutely no communication. They got it. They turned around and said, hey, could we interview you and talk about why you did that? Um, they're going to record the, the, the conversation probably in a format like this mm. and, and send that out. So, and to me, yeah. I think that is so much more powerful because the organization isn't really asking people to do that. The donor is saying, this is what I did. We didn't need the money. We paid it forward and we would challenge anyone in, this, in a similar situation, not everyone, but people in a situation like us, to do the same. And, and it doesn't just be, have to be in the context of a stimulus. It can be any of your supporters 
Why are you a monthly donor? Why have you continued the monthly gift during this time? Why are you a volunteer that used to come in and, and fill food boxes and now we're, you know, I'm doing something else. I'm, happen I'm helping with uh, delivery, whatever it is that transition to, even if it's an all digital, put your supporters on display because for a potential supporter to hear from an actual supporter is really powerful and, and might be even more powerful than hearing from the, the actual organization or a representative of the organization uh, in need, maybe even more than a direct service recipient. Service recipients is always a little hard to kind of put on camera perhaps because there's always exploitation issues and it might be just hard now because of social distancing. But if you have donors that have stepped up to the plate recently, you know, ask them, hey, could, could we interview you for a, a newsletter article, for a Facebook post? Maybe could we even record the conversation on Zoom? Because um, I, I want to show off your generosity and, and I think you can inspire other people. So it doesn't just have to be all of you asking. You know, it can be people that are already doing these things and it might be even more, more powerful. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. What's another question? Um, Okay, so Nancy's asking, when we're phone calling people, um, should there be an ask included? I'm paraphrasing there, so hopefully, yes. So if, you know, as opposed to leaving a voicemail message when they get someone, should she be asking? I, I think it just depends on how the conversation goes. I think you've got to just be, have your antenna up and have your listening ears on for, for those cues. If it seems like they're doing okay, um, you know, I, I, I think I always sort of favor being a little bit more bold than maybe some people would. But if, if you hear things that are, are major red flags, like my spouse wa lost their job or one of our kids is sick, like I would, I would probably stay off. But if, if you're getting all good signals from them, you know, I would try it. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. You have to first and foremost, make sure they're okay. And that's part of the conversation. Yeah. But, you know, like we were talking about, it's time to ask. Um, I think the for the most part, people that are not asking, it's because you're nervous about asking. Um, I think if you make it also not about, first of all, not about money, make it about impact, make it about mission. So, right, say, um, would you consider, um, ensuring that we're able to do blah, 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 or whatever the impact or the mission is. So make sure that you're asking for impact and then you can talk about how much that impact costs or what difference that kind of they want to make. Um, but you know, you can talk about how monthly supporters enable us to be financially stable all year round so that we can support the this or the that or whatever it is your mission that you're doing. Um, so if you're, to me, if the conversation goes well and they seem enthusiastic and they're pleased to have been a longtime supporter and then you're not asking, you're making a mistake. Yeah, and, and what you ask for, again, should be different based on what you already know about them and, and maybe what they're telling you. Like if they're a monthly donor, you know, maybe ask them for a, sm a small upgrade. If they are a, a longtime annual donor, maybe, you know, making that annual gift early uh, I, th I think that's a really good ask right now is, is to kind of front load the, the year end gift. If you, if you know that has occurred in the past. Yeah, that's interesting. Or get them on to monthly giving if they've yeah. been a one time, you know, all yep. of your donors who give a hundred dollars, you should be asking for $20 a month, yep. which would oh. more than double their gift. Oh, oh no. The lifetime value. Oh no. I totally, the lifetime value, like exponentially I, the, the lifetime value of a $5 a month donor is like a thousand dollars. So if you get a $20, I just do the math, but it, it's gotta be multiple thousands of dollars. So yeah, uh, that's an awesome ass as an upgrade to a monthly. Uh, right. Just monthly. think you have someone who gives a hundred dollars at year end, but $20 a month is $240. So just yeah. by getting them to yeah. go, and if they can give $100 at the end, year end, they probably can give $20 a month without yeah. any trouble at all. Yeah. And you've more than doubled their gift. And um, their retention rate goes from 45% to 80, just because you get the, the credit card number or ACH or whatever it is. 
Okay, so I just want to make sure that everybody understands what Stephen means by that. Getting, right? getting some math. <laughs> well, so um, I'm wondering how many people on the call know their donor retention rate. Oh yeah, this is my favorite. Right. So give us a yes, no, yes, or I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, good, Daphne. Ooh, you there are lots of yeses. That's awesome. I'm not yeah. surprised. This is a sharp group. If they're yeah, yeah, forty three percent. Okay, I'm even seeing some numbers. Nice. Yeah, excellent. Yes. So donor retention rate are 59? those wow. donors you keep year after year after year. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we saw some flashes that if you have seventy percent, they sh you need to interview that person next week, Amy. Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> <laughs> right. So listen, what Stephen was saying that whatever your donor retention rate is, how many ever donors you keep from year to year. First of all, goal number one to try and increase that. So figuring out what you can do, what kind of stewardship, what kind of cultivation to make sure that you're getting those numbers up. Yeah, we've got some people on here with great donor wow. rates. Um, awesome. And so, but the point is that monthly donors, their donor retention rates are significantly higher because the number, they don't cancel basically. No. You know, once people nope. sign up to be a monthly donor, they do not cancel unless the credit card expires. Yep. Um, and so if you can be on top of that credit card expiring and uh, get in front of that, then it's very unlikely that they are going to um, uh, cancel. Now, you know, we're seeing a, maybe the cancellation rate on those is going up a little bit in these yeah. times, but um, I'm still not worried about it at all. All right, good. Oh, we've got some awesome donor retention rate. All right, so yeah. let me let me look and see. We've got so many questions. Okay, so Beth says they've been stewarding a donor for six months who has not made a gift yet, but mm. she doesn't say whether they've asked them for a gift. So Beth, mm. I don't know whether you've asked yet, but you wanna know if you can approach her for a gift for crisis campaign. I think absolutely, why not, right? Yeah. You've been cultivating her. Um, yep. I, don't, I don't know if she already said no, but it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like you've asked her. Any, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that, Stephen? Yeah, the worst you can get is a no. I mean, ask right. her. Right, and listen, you're gonna always ask in a respectful, thoughtful way. You're gonna acknowledge that this is going on. Yeah. Um, some donors may decide um, if, she, if she says no, then say, listen, is the timing bad? Because we know the market's down, right? Do you want to make this kind of a gift um, when the market turns around a little bit? So don't end the conversation with a yes or a no. It's just, okay, let's talk about what kind of gift you do want to make and when, right? So um, a, no, a soft no, to me, a no isn't, isn't a hard, not never kind of no. no. You have to be able to figure out what, how, to, how to make it a yes. Um, all right, so Julie says, we are unable to serve clients at this time. Hmm. We did receive a large part of our revenue through medical assistance, which is now gone. Is it appropriate to share this in some way as part of our need and story? I think so. I mean, if, if you're in crisis, I, I think that's a compelling case for support. Um, so, you know, going back to the transparency thing, um, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't shy away from leading with that, certainly. Yeah. So I, you know, under normal circumstances, I would say, you know, you don't want to come at fundraising from a p position of desperation. Right. It, you don't ever want to tell donors, you know, help us keep on the lights or help us keep the doors open because we're going to be shutting them next month. Yeah. Uh, because nobody wants to throw that money down the drain. They know you're going to be back to them next month. But I think right now, those rules in part don't apply. Mm -hmm. Everybody's in trouble and everybody's struggling. And you know, your doors may be closed if you're a performing arts center or school or all sorts of organizations. And so you can say, you know, sus help sustain us through this tough time and make sure that we're able to open and be back immediately as soon as it's safe to do so. Um, and, and you need to figure out specifically what your case in and around is of that. Um, okay. Uh, we had a lot of peer-to-peer -peer questions, Amy. I don't know if you yeah. want to. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so Kaylee says, I would love your thoughts on creative peer-to-peer -peer fundraising during this time. So what have you seen, Stephen? So the, the same people that maybe you would want to interview because they're awesome donors, I, I think those are also good people to ask to, to do those fundraising campaigns, you know, go out on Facebook, maybe if it's their birthday, you know, if you have birthday data in your database, 
that's that's kind of an interesting kind of sneaky way to use data to make a contextual outreach. You know, maybe you say, hey, Amy, I see your birthday's coming up next week. Mm. By the way, I hope that's not creepy. We just, we happen to have that information. Um, <laughs> ha- have you ever done a, a, a Facebook birthday fundraiser? You know, if, if you, if you haven't, or you're willing to, you know, you could, you could potentially raise a lot of money for us from your, your friends and family, you know, what do you think? And give them some tools to do that. Don't just ask them that and then hope they do it. But if you can give them sample posts or graphics or, you know, links to certain pages you might want to send out there, kind of the more, more you equip them to do um, is good. You know, the, the people you can, you can let data drive who you ask to do those peer to peer campaigns, but, but, and some people will do it without you asking. There'll be very few and far between, and you should be looking out for those people because they are like superstars regardless of how much money they raise or how much money they give themselves. The fact that they're doing that campaign is a, is a huge signal. Um, but I, you know, I think you could reach out to people who have birthdays coming up, people who are monthly donors. Again, I feel like we keep talking about monthly donors, but they're just so awesome. Um, cause they really like you long-term donors, um, people that have in the past shared your content on social media. So they're already kind of there. Um, and there's that propensity to, to, to act in that sort of arena. Um, you know, but let it drive you. Don't just, don't just send an email to everyone and say, Hey, if your birthday's coming up, you know, consider it because that's not going to work very well. And that may look really weird right now to be talking about birthday fundraisers to everybody. Um, but <laughs> well, reach out to them, you know, and say, you could do, you could do all of April. You could run or may, right. Yeah. You could say you have a Absolutely. birthday next month. You don't necessarily have to do it day by day or week by week, you could say, um, you know, a week before it's my birthday month. month, you could say, Hey, we see you have a birthday coming up next month. And so that yeah. might make it easier um, for some of these small shops to do it 12 times. And I of love that hundreds of times. So Megan's saying <laughs> um, Facebook makes Stephen, you know, you're talking about Facebook fundraising. Facebook makes it really difficult to see who donates to the birthday fundraiser. This is my favorite question of all time. Okay, good. Answer. Right, who, who was the, who was the person's name? What Megan, name? Megan, Megan. Here's my answer. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Those people are probably not going to give to you again. So the person you should be worrying about, and I don't mean to be snarky, but the best person, person is, it's the fundraiser. Yeah. Make sure, take all of that energy that you want to, and this is good energy, that you want to use to thank all those donors, take all that energy and give it to the fundraiser because That's they- awesome. They raise the money. They should get the soft credits for the gifts. The re- retention rates on peer-to-peer donors is like less than 10%. It's the lowest cohort. It's even lower than like memorial tribute donors. Don't worry about it. Thank the fundraiser and say, man, that was, you know, you raised 250 bucks, 300 bucks, 1,000 bucks for us on Facebook. Shower them with all of that love and adoration because that money came from them. It, you know, I, I know there were third party donors. And sometimes when, when we, if we do get that information, we kind of swoop in and act like we're that person's best friend. And they may not even know who our organization is, what we do. They were just supporting, you know, their buddy, Amy, who <laughs> it was their birthday and they, there was a donate button. I clicked donate. Like that's, that's literally what happens in those people's mind. They're not like looking very closely at the organization or kind of researching them. It's, it's kind of a fear of missing out and, and a little bit of a showing off thing because you want to you wanna be on that, that roster of donors, right? You don't want to be, not be on that list. So don't worry about it. I mean, it's not a big deal. Now, some, some peer-to-peer, um, like if you have peer-to-peer software and it's off Facebook, you, know, you may get that donor information. If you do have the donor information, don't ignore it. But again, utilize the fundraiser. Maybe have them send the thank you on your behalf. Amy, thanks so much for donating to my, my 5K, my virtual 5K now. Um, by the way, the nonprofit that you supported is so-and-so foundation in Kansas City. This is why I chose them to mm. raise money for. I would really love it if you considered supporting them in the future. Here's a, a link to their website maybe even CC uh, an employee there and say, hey, if you ever want to talk to these folks, here's a person you can talk to. But do that kind of bridge. Because if you just send an acknowledgement letter from you, they may not know what the heck that is. They may not even, they may not connect the dots between their gift and, and that campaign and that thank you. So utilize the fundraiser if you have the donor information. 
if you don't get it, it's that's really not. And, and I'm the retention guy, so this kind of hurts me to be saying like, don't worry about retaining these donors. This I is love the only it. time. But kind of the same with memorial gifts. Honestly, they they don't have a connection to you. You may be able to convince one percent of them to to continue to supporting you, but I, I would worry about the fundraiser and worry about trying to get more fundraisers out there. Um, then try to um, hold on to the donors that, that give to those campaigns. Yeah, it's kind of an unpopular opinion. Yeah. Not a lot of people think that way about peer to peer, but I just I say, love it. I I was surprised by your answer. Yeah, I know because I'm, I'm <laughs> that made it even better because you're so um, definitive about it too. <laughs> like there was no question in your mind about it. And since uh, Stephen pays attention to the data, we're going to take his word on this one. I I think once you explain it, it makes perfect sense. And you know, it does sort of hurt to think you're not going to be following up or cultivating donors but those aren't really donors they're they're not giving to you because they yeah. care so much about your organization they're like diet donors they're like they're like off-brand do donors kind of. <laughs> they're well they're just like giving their friend a birthday present yeah it's, instead of giving their their friend a birthday present but so. the thought is good like the heart's in the right place you want to thank those people and, and hold on to them but the technology just makes it it, it just it kind of stinks it makes it hard yeah all right brilliant so here's how we're going to wrap up um, we've done this at different places in the webinar every time, but in order to convince your boards and your executive directors, if they still need convincing that they should be fundraising now, we want to see some examples of money you've raised in the last two weeks. So for those of you that have oh, wow. gotten gifts, who've gotten new donors, who've re uh, gotten lapsed donors back, um, tell us your organization, because sometimes when we do this, people say, well, maybe they're just healthcare organizations, or maybe they're just food organizations. So yeah. I want to hear from everybody, you know, just let us know one gift that you got, that you've gotten to goal. Okay, so $35,000 from the Robin Hood Foundation. Wow. Awesome. Two new donors sending in their stimulus checks. Go, yes. Amy. Okay, $5,000 from a donor who was looking forward to our paddle raise and didn't want to wait to the rescheduled gala. Cool. Oh, look at these, all these, um, these awesome, awesome gifts coming in. Um, 25,000 from the Vancouver Foundation. Wow. Uh, service dogs, $5,000. 50,000 gift today who said no to them a month ago. Kaylee, you're our winner today. Good for Kaylee's you. Kaylee's my hero. Wow, that's awesome. Um, that is awesome. All right, so a social justice organization just raised, oh my gosh, they're going so by, by, by so quickly. I lost it. $2,000 um, for one of our parks, thanks to the Caterpillar Foundation. 25, 250,000 match for a donation dollar for dollar for a Whoa. family clinic, um, 5,000 in annual renewal. Yay, $10,000 made your donor. Oh, a $10,000 just gave $35,000. Um, if I read that right, wow, uh, 500 from a new board member who recognized times will be tough. Oh my gosh. And they, oh my gosh, the, the list goes on and on. You guys, I love finishing on this positive note. So a virtual uh, clap and thank you to Stephen for being here today. Oh, for yeah, this, joining is, us. this is fun yeah. for me. <laughs> All right. So Stephen, one more time, put your um, contact message yeah. uh, stuff in just because it's going by so fast. Okay. We can send it out for sure to people. Um, so. Yeah, and, and all of you can email me anytime. Um, yeah, I, I love it. So, all right, great. <laughs> Steven, thank you so much for being here. Look at these, they're still coming in $6,000 6, last week in response to our very first email appeal. Their only email appeal. That is wow, awesome. that's that's pretty good for one email. That's awesome. Wow. And, and for a first time email, yeah. $6,000. That's great. Um, so this is just more and more and more proof that you guys should be asking and asking and asking. $5,000 unsolicited gift due to COVID-19, $20,000 in fi five days to our relief fund from Pamela. Andrew says a $10,000 grant from a STEM foundation who originally turned them down. Look at this, all these fundraisers. Um, so you've got to ask. So thanks everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys. Stay healthy. Thanks, Stephen.